So good morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome, <laughs> welcome to the uh, 2020 regional gathering for Mensa here in Florida. Uh, how many of you have been here before to a regional gathering? Couple. Okay. This is my first one, so I'm actually kind of curious to see what else happens today. But I've been honored to be able to give a presentation to you guys, and we are going to cover psychology and technology in education. Uh, for those that might have read the program, my name is Chase DeMarco. I have an MBA in healthcare administration, a master's in educational psychology. All well, my PhD work for that was finished except the dissertation, so I can't, can't go with PhD yet. And uh, I'm currently working on finishing up my medical degree. So a lot of this material that we're covering today uh, has really coalesced the information that I've learned from educational psychology and from medicine and through some of the other activities that I've gone over, which we can see uh, in a second. So who am I? I'm a bit of, bit of a scientist, I'd like to say, consider myself one, an academic, and a bit of a nerd. <laughs> Another thing is I create online and free materials for pre-meds and medical students. Uh, these are two podcasts that I have, and then a book that recently come, came out last, uh, last year, late last year. And through these materials, I have been able to interview dozens of the top educators, top uh, memory athletes in the world, and uh, cognitive psychologists that deal specifically with learning. So I've been able to utilize a lot of this material and sort of consolidate it in a useful manner for my student audience. And I'm going to try to explain these in a more generalizable way that can be used for any of your learners or if you are still learners yourself. So the broad points we'll cover today are some of the most evidence-based techniques for study skills and for learning, and some evidence-based ones that don't work out so well. A lot of this will be associated with the cognitive psychology and learning psychology realms. Uh, these fields of psychology really help do a lot of the background research to determine what works and what doesn't, and maybe why. <coughs> um, the accelerated learning section of this will be revolving around memory techniques, mnemonics, and speed reading, and we'll also do a brief stint on how technology has shaped current education and will continue to do so for some time. So we've all been through education. Some of us might still be teachers, but it's very common that we don't learn how to learn. No one really stops to think about how we learn and the most effective ways to do so. And we're going to try to discover why we learn better some ways and why some things we do traditionally or even have been passed down uh, uh, from our current instructors might not be that effective. <clears throat> some of the top mistakes that learners make, number one, being highlighted. Highlighting has been shown time and time again to not provide a lot of benefit for learners. And a lot of this has to do with the techniques that they uh, use, such as over-highlighting, one of the most common mistakes with highlighting. <clears throat> if you've ever purchased a used book before, you might have noticed that every page is just completely highlighted, and that defeats the purpose. Highlighting means to you know, emphasize certain materials, certain key words, uh, key topics that you are struggling with, and a lot of learners don't use this technique properly. But besides that, most materials nowadays, such as textbooks, often have all the key things highlighted and bolded for you. There's no need to go through the extra effort of highlighting, and in fact, by highlighting, often your brain is focusing on what you need to highlight instead of trying to consolidate it into your memory. Second one is rereading, especially in the aspect of textbooks. Rereading certain pages, certain chapters, skimming through them before a test, it's not usually that productive. Often we will go through it and say multiple repetitions of a certain type of material, will benefit us. But if we didn't get the information the first time, there's probably a reason. There's likely some other obstacle there than just reading it <coughs> that we could work towards towards changing the next time. And this will get into more active learning techniques. Do the same thing with our notes. I highly recommend to most learners that, as opposed to highlighting, they do handwrite notes. This acts on different pathways in the brain and can help consolidate information in a, a stronger, more robust way because you have to think about what you're writing down. You have to synthesize the material yourself and then write it out, translate it out in a way that makes sense to you. But rereading those notes after that generally don't provide a lot of benefit. It's still a passive action. We're going through it and saying, okay, I recognize this, I recognize that. 
And all you're doing is recognizing material. You're not actually testing your ability to recall the material if you need to synthesize it later on or if you were having a debate with somebody later on. So these are all passive learning techniques, technically. Um, they can also be in the form of listening to lectures, whether this be audio or uh, video lectures. Just listening to them over and over is not going to produce the learning, the long-term retention that we're going for <clears throat> in most educational scenarios. So there's four main steps to learning. That This is how I like to divide them up. This is a very nuanced way, but a very simple way. And this starts off with our personal development, our personal health and wellness. The second one is prioritization. We want to make sure that we know what we have to do and we prioritize what we have to do first. And then if there's extra time, we can get to the other uh, tactics or the other materials that we'd like to, but might not be as important. Third is actually implementing these skills that will increase our long-term retention and understanding of material and synthesizing that material better for us personally, whatever techniques work better for us. And then last is self-assessment. If we're in a traditional education system, they often have assessments through grades, through report cards and such. But there are also techniques that learners can implement for self-assessment on top of this, or if you're in a non-traditional environment, learning from online classes, just teaching yourself at home. Self-assessment is the only way to really judge that you're learning the material that you want to learn. <clears throat> so the first one, health and wellness. A lot of this is going to be somewhat common sense in the aspect that you've all most likely heard these topics before, but might not have heard why. First one, eating right. We know we should eat better. How many people here cook most of their meals at home? Oh, pretty good. Higher percentage than I thought. And the reason I bring that up in specific is because it is very difficult to eat out frequently and eat healthy. What they do to get you there is to make food tasty. What do they do to make it tasty? Add extra salt, extra sugar, extra... Yep, exactly. So preparing most of your meals at home is generally going to be a good way to assess if you're eating healthy that day, that week, that month. Of course, there's a lot of variation depending on what you buy at the store and how you prepare it, but it's a good step in the right direction for most people. Of course, we want to focus on the low fats, low sugars, low salts, but also low stimulants. So decreasing nicotine, even decreasing caffeine. I know that one's a lot controversial. Every year there's a new study saying this or that. Uh, decreasing depressants on the other end of the spectrum, so your alcohol intake. All of these that work on your physical health and morbidity and mortality rates also are going to work for your cognitive functions too. So these are something that we can uh, benefit our learners or ourselves by understanding them better. And we'll have some charts at the, uh, on the next slide to go over this in a little more detail. <clears throat> Eating healthy can also help hormonal regulation, which can help sleeping better. Now, in general, we've probably heard the six to nine hours uh, a night rule. And really, it's confusing and it changes frequently. But for anyone that is pre-teenage years, actually generally requires on average more sleep than nine hours. So don't get mad at your preteen if they're sleeping all day. Um, for anyone that's teenage years and older, the Sleep Foundation actually recommends eight to nine hours and not less. Traditionally, we've always kind of assumed that uh, more advanced age, we sleep less and less. And often this is due to changes in lifestyle, changes in quality of life, changes in medication, not necessarily that you need to sleep less. So it's still recommended to get eight to nine hours of sleep a day. If you do a little bit less, it's probably fine. Of course, this is the average. Not everyone will fit into this mold. There are people on the extremes. I have a friend that's always slept five hours a night and I hated him for it because he always got a lot more done, but that's just how his body works. But he's on, he's an outlier. He is not within the, the normal range for the most part. And the reason that we really need to focus on sleep is because it does a lot more for us than we normally think. It helps to regulate the, um, the cleaning of materials in and around our brain and our body and helps us to focus better by getting rid of metabolic waste that our brain produces throughout the day. But it also helps when, uh, when we consider REM sleep. This is the main focus of sleep hygiene that we need to consider. <clears throat> what I mean by sleep hygiene is generally going to sleep around the same time every day, sleeping about the same amount of time every day. And by forming these good patterns, you can increase the numbers of cycles of REM that you go into. And why REM is so important and why you don't want to try to sleep hack, such as sleeping two or three hours and then taking naps throughout the day and 
multiple variations out there you might read about or hear about from productivity experts. Don't do those. There's no good studies showing that they're beneficial, especially over the long term. In fact, they can cause sleep deprivation in a multitude of people. And you decrease the numbers of REM cycles you go through per night. <coughs> REM works kind of strange. Your first cycle might start after about an hour and a half, but then the next one's going to come quicker and quicker and quicker. So the longer you sleep, the more cycles you potentially have at the end of the night. When you try to sleep hack or cut your sleep short, you're decreasing the number of REM cycles you will get each night, and that can greatly affect your cognitive abilities. <coughs> of course, exercise. Raise your hand if you exercise five or more times a week. Again, this is a great group. <laughs> uh, the numbers do vary depending on what recommendations you're going by. Some say three or more times a week. Some say five or more times a week, 20 minutes per day or more. And ideally, you want to try to do this all at one time so you're keeping your heart rate at a steady pace for 20 plus minutes. If you can't do that, doing little bits throughout the day is not a bad idea. You always hear parking farther in a, a parking lot away from the door. Many people hear that. They don't implement it or taking the stairs instead of the escalator or elevator. Many people hear that, but then as soon as they see the escalator or elevator, they hop on that instead. Um, doing little bits every day for your exercise, for your health, for your sleep can have an additive benefit within each other. They all help uh, somewhat symbiotically to affect the others, and they affect your mood, they affect your cognitive abilities. <coughs> and the last one I want to talk about since we have physical health is spiritual health. For most people, this constitutes either prayer and or meditation. I'm going to focus mostly on meditation because that is where a lot of the research I've studied in the past has been, but there are similar researches done for different styles of prayer for different religious aspects, but also meditation has the benefit for those that want a secular way to conduct spiritual health as well. And a good recommendation uh, I always point towards for the, the best research out there that's been conducted that I've found is probably in the book Altered Traits. And what they did is went through thousands of research journals over the, the past couple of decades since the research on meditations exploded, but most of it's not strong research. They took the top 1%, the ones that were conducted the best, the ones that were the most unbiased, and they determined that there are benefits that we didn't really think about before. There are state benefits and there are trait benefits. These <coughs> state benefits are more transient. Think of it as after you work out, you'll have a little more muscle. If you don't work out for a couple of weeks, you might decrease some of that muscle. Similar with meditation, there are certain aspects of the meditation, certain benefits that can decrease over time, which is why you want to implement it on a regular basis if you do so. However, they also notice that there are some uh, trait benefits that are more permanent. Again, using the example of exercise, microfiber tears that happen in your muscle, those don't go away just because your muscle tone goes away. So you can drive both uh, permanent and temporary benefits from implementing practices such as these. And they just kind of go with the whole personal health and wellness thing. This is all the first stage of prep that you should be probably doing or your learner should be doing on a regular basis to increase their cognitive abilities. <coughs> now for the non... Oh yeah, uh, I said there was uh, some charts, two simple charts to follow if you want to uh, just have a guideline or something to print out or hand out to someone. I would recommend these two. First one is Life Simple 7. This is by the American Heart, um, American Cardiology Association, uh, American Heart Association, I believe, same thing. Um, and seven simple rules to follow, same things we've sort of already discussed, increase your activity, exercise, decrease fat, decrease your blood sugar, uh, lose weight is another one that they add here that's not on the previous recommendations, um, and, and just eating better in general, and of course, cutting back on nicotine, on smoking. Other one I use often is the Daily Dozen. This is by Dr. Michael Greger. He's kind of a controversial figure because he advocates for a plant-based whole foods diet. Uh, so there are proponents and opponents that are pretty extreme on both sides of that argument. But I do like this chart because it's very simple. He says and grades how many of each dose you should have on a daily basis according to the research he's done. And it's increase in beans for the, the plant-based protein, the fiber, increased berries for antioxidants. Uh, increase in different vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, green leafy ones for the uh, phytochemicals and other nutrients in there that you can't find readily in a lot of other sources of food. So having a, a balance in these types of foods, and he also adds exercise and healthy <coughs> drinks, water, um, can greatly influence uh, your just your natural state and make sure to optimize your health. 
<coughs> so that was sort of the long-term consistent you should do every day kind of planning for your personal wellness. But what do we do when we actually need our learners or ourselves to properly prioritize all of our materials? And depending on where you are in your stage of education or where your learners might be, this is a, a huge problem because a lot of learners will just follow the curriculum and not do any extra work themselves. They won't know how. They were never taught to. So planning and prioritizing the materials that are available to them through their school and elsewhere can really help to make their time the most efficient as possible for their, for their study. So where do we go before we learn? <coughs> Goal setting is a huge, huge, huge benefit. And it's surprising how overlooked it can be. There are many different ways to goal set, and there are many different end goals in mind with this goal setting. One that's shown a lot of promise is SMART goals. And this stands for specific. You want your tasks right now to be specific to a particular goal, not a generalizable goal. This is not a New Year's resolution. Uh, measurable. We need a way to make sure we're actually progressing throughout our studies. Attainable. We want to make sure it's not too flamboyant. Something that we can't reach that'll just lead to negative self-talk later on and possibly negatively affect our study. Want it to be relevant. Again, very relevant to our material. We might want to tra uh, <clears throat> train for a triathlon or let's just say a, a marathon. So we go out and ride our bike every day. Well, that'll increase our general health, but it's not going to train us for the running, for the marathon itself. So sometimes it's easy to get lost in the weeds and do certain techniques or have certain goals that don't really concisely and relevantly apply to our end goal. And then, of course, time bound. We don't want to leave open-ended uh, time constraints. We want to make sure we have it for this day, this week, this month, this quarter, this year, whatever the time bound aspect is, to make sure we keep ourselves on track. And then if we fall behind, we can then assess why that happened to make sure it doesn't happen again. Often we'll fall behind and just say, okay, I'll pick it up later. It doesn't happen. So ha setting SMART goals is a very great way of being specific and measuring our goals and making sure we stay on track. Also forming habits. This could be a great one for uh, all of the, the last slide too, for increasing your health and wellness, because a lot of things we do is by negative habit forming. So getting rid of those negative habits or forming new positive habits can be very strong in making sure we're the most cognitively fit we can be and set for our educational goals. Two methods that I hear a lot about, and there's been a, a lot of popular books in recent years, Atomic Habits and uh, I think The Power of Habits by Charles Duhigg, uh, they all recommend slightly different things, one of which is to first notice your trigger. In The Power of Habits, he uses the example of cigarette smokers often smoking after a meal or when they get in the car. Well, the trigger is not that they want to light up. The trigger is actually getting into the car or that feeling of satiation that they're full that triggers them to do the negative habit. So noticing what the trigger point is, is the first step to being aware of how to change it. Similarly with education, we might have a messy desk and that might prevent us from going and sitting down, it might prevent your learners from utilizing all the time. So maybe finding out what triggers we have. If it's a messy desk, clean up beforehand. If it's being distracted, make sure to put your phone on do not disturb between these hours. Finding the trigger and finding a way to get past that trigger or to change the trigger from a negative habit to a positive habit is one very strong way to make slow changes. And habits are slowly changing. I think they used to say it was 60 days to create a habit, now it's 30 days, maybe vice versa. Either way, this is not gonna happen in a day or a week or a couple of weeks. It's going to most likely take a month or two to really get a habit down. So this is important to notice for yourself or any learners you might have that these things take time, but everything is slow incremental change. That is the goal. A slightly newer topic is called WHOOP, and that stands for Wish, Outcome, Obstacle, and Plan. The way I look at this, it's, it's a plan for failure. Not planning for failure is planning for failure. Failures will arise in our studies, in our life, and not being able to think ahead to what those failure points might be and then plan ways to circumvent them is just leading us to failure. So it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, this was actually recently used for medical residents in anesthesiology. Um, I think it had to do that particular study with them reading more or less depending on how they set up their plans. I think they might have compared it to SMART goals too. I think of WHOOP as SMART goals plus a plan for failure. Having your plan in place, which is the wish, 
and the outcome that you expect to happen at the end of that wish. But then also noticing or trying to, as best as possible, point out where all your failure points could be. Yes? I just have a question. I'm confused as to whether this is like um, realizing a fantasy versus planning how to avoid or get around an expected failure. Or I'm, I'm feeling like it could be either, but that's not how you're speaking. Ooh, good question. So, uh, I'll try to clarify a little bit. An example that I was given when interviewing one of the um, the main proponents of the, the past study is he said, what if you want to increase your social abilities or go talk to this girl on a bus or something and you just can't get your, get brave enough to do it, can't get your guts up to do it. Um, well, your outcome, your wish is that you talk to her. Your outcome is that she doesn't throw it back in your face or reject you. So having that outcome in place, then you can plan what are all the obstacles? Well, maybe she's not there or maybe she's sick or maybe I don't have anything to talk about. Well, that's probably the top one. I don't have anything to say. Okay, so let's plan. What can I say before entering that situation? I hope that helps. Well, we called it a what if. Now I am. Okay. Go either way. Gotcha. Uh, there's a great website for that too. Uh, Whoop My Life, I believe it's called. I forget if it's .com or .org, but they're sort of the ones that came up with this terminology. The actual name of of this process is ridiculous to say, so I'm not going to say it. So, uh, Whoop is much easier for most of us to remember anyway. Um, and then the last one for kind of goal setting and preparatory here before we get into the prior to prioritization of materials is mindset. Uh, most of us have probably heard at this point since there are such big keywords in education, growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Basically states that people that think they're in a fixed mindset believe that they are only capable of a certain level of education or a certain amount of material. Everyone else must be just naturally genetically better than them. And we've found this is definitely not true. And having that negative self-talk is one of our biggest obstacles, one of the biggest hindrances we can have in education. But before we even start studying or before we go to class or before a presentation, whatever our uh, activity might be, going in with a positive mindset, self-talk, being positive, and knowing that we can do anything everyone else can. It just might be a little harder, might take a little more time, a little bit more work, but knowing that we can reach that can greatly influence how that day's activities go. So highly recommend all learners start a situ or start their study session or um go towards an activity with the positive mindset, knowing that this is not going to be a failure. This is going to be a success. I just have to put in the work. <clears throat> now, depending on where a learner is in their education, especially if we're talking about maybe grad school type material, there are tons of resources through your school. There are tons of resources that other students recommend. There are tons of study resources, review books, and other third-party resources. We have books, we have videos, we have audio, we have endless amounts of information to go through. And sometimes finding out the information or the resources that are going to be the best for you can be very difficult or best for a learner. I actually like to use a lot of business techniques in education because who knows better on how to be, uh, how to maximize their efficiency than successful businesses. They have to compete with other companies with similar products, similar timelines, but beat them out. And the best way to do that is to become efficient. So if we take some of those principles and apply them to our education, we can also become much more efficient in our education. Two of them for business techniques that I like to uh, use, and there are infinite numbers, are the Pareto Principle, which is also known as the 80-20 rule, and ABCs, or activity-based costing. So the Pareto Principle basically states that 80% of what we need to know can come from 20% of the material. So a comparison could be loosely, and it depends on the subject, but maybe in a textbook. If you read the keywords, skim through the, the chapter, the table of contents, then you have an outline of everything. You know what the keywords are, whether they're in the back of the book or you skim through and read the bolded parts within a chapter. And you read the questions at the end of each chapter, you probably have a great concept of what is covered there. You know the outline, you know the main points, main terms, main people involved, and you know the questions that the author thought were important for that chapter. That could be considered the 20% of that chapter that gets you 80% of the information. Now that you have a good basic foundation of it, a basic outline, you can go through and skim through the rest of the chapter or read it thoroughly, whatever your preference is, to get the other 80% if you need 
clarification on certain parts. And if you're already familiar with certain topics, you might need the or might be able to skip that subsection of a text or that chapter altogether. So finding this out ahead of time, saying, okay, I know all of this very well. I've learned about this in another class where I had this personal experience that taught me this can save you a lot of time in your education. So discovering which resources are going to benefit you can be a little time consuming, can be a little difficult at first to get used to, but once you do that, you can then just focus on the most important ones and come back to the other ones if you have time, but know that you don't need to necessarily cover everything and waste a lot of time that can be better spent on actual practice techniques, which we'll cover in a few slides. Activity-based costing is uh, somewhat similar in the aspect that we have to focus on getting the most out of each task. So if we say, I spent 80% of my learning time in class with lectures, 10% at home reading a textbook, 5% doing homework, and 5% doing other things, maybe looking up YouTube videos or something to supplement the information that I didn't understand. <clears throat> but then discovering how much of that was useful. Maybe I'm only getting 10% of the information I actually need from the lectures, but I'm spending 80% of the time there. So kind of doing this return on investment for each resource you're using can also help to determine which resources are better for each learning scenario, each learning environment, and each learner in general. So basically, it's a concept of return on investment for educational materials. Um, of course, if we're prioritization or for prioritization, we need to obviously have different schedules. A school curriculum at the beginning of the year, or beginning of the semester, is not going to be sufficient. Things change. Uh, of course, the resources we use might change, and having different schedules for weekly, daily, uh, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, however you want to separate them, I definitely recommend short-term schedules and long-term schedules. <clears throat> but on top of this, make sure you prioritize the things up top that really need to get done. One of the biggest failure points for to-do lists is people put down everything they want to do without prioritizing what they need to do at the top. Then you do the easy ones first, you do the ones you want to first, and you don't have times for the ones you actually need to do later on that aren't as much fun necessarily, but probably more important in the long run. So again, this prioritization of our to-do list, of our schedules, putting them in an order, numbering them, making sure to do them in that numbered order, some sort of tactic like that to make sure we're not wasting time on the, the fun things or the easy things can reduce the stress later on and putting off the important tasks to the end. Okay. Not too bad. I only had a day and a half to prepare this, so I'm not entirely sure how my timing is going. I want to make sure I'm not too far behind because I do have some practice techniques at the end that uh, hopefully we'll have some time to, to play around with. So now we've done all the prep work. We have prepared ourselves over the past few days, weeks, months, hopefully on a more permanent basis with physical health, exercise, dieting. We have set up our goals, prioritized which resources we're going to use and why they're going to be better and which ones we uh, prefer. And now here are the actual techniques for when we study. The evidence-based techniques that are really um, robust at this point mainly consist of the ones listed here. A uh, great resource if you want more information on any one of these in particular would be The Learning Scientist. They have a podcast and a website that covers a lot of this information as well in more depth. I'm going to try to go through the first couple real briefly and uh, hopefully have some time to get to the examples of our accelerated learning training at the end. So elaboration, many times we hear something in a class by a lecturer or read it in a book and we have a surface knowledge of it, but then later on we can't recall it. A lot of this has to do with not having a deep understanding of the material. So elaborating on material can greatly help with specific topics within a learner's education. There's a multitude of ways to use elaboration, whether this be just check a Wikipedia page, which you know, a lot of people scoff at, but for the most part, the material is often quite good and there are resources at the bottom of every page that you can use. If you have a better resource than that, such as a a research journal that you're familiar with for more advanced um, information, that's great as well. Anything that can help you understand to a deeper degree the information that you only had a surface knowledge of before. A lot of times students will use YouTube videos, for instance, <clears throat> to get graphic representations which can help visual learners a little bit better. Concrete examples. Some instructors are really good about giving concrete examples for some topics, and, but it's usually only one, if any. The problem with this is some concrete examples work better for certain learners depending on their past experiences, depending on what knowledge they have as a base, uh, as a foundational knowledge of that example. 
So it is recommended, especially for instructors, to try to think up a couple of concrete examples for any sort of topic. That way, this one might be understood by this student, this one might be understood by that student, and you're reaching a greater learner base. It also helps as a self-check. If you have one concrete example and you can't remember if all the things applied or just parts of that applied to what you're actually studying, well, if you have multiple ones, you can say, yes, it works here, yes, it works here, no, it doesn't work there. Okay, I think in general this principle can be applied to the topic I'm studying. Um, this might not be the best example, but for uh, medicine, for anatomy, I often use the lungs and an uh, association to balloons because they're very elastic and deal with air. And um, that can work for many aspects of the anatomy of it and, and sort of a graphic representation of how the lungs work, but they don't work so well for the physiology of a lung because the air has to permeate the lung to get into the bloodstream. So the more concrete examples you can give a learner, the better off they're likely to make the correct associations and, and also form a deeper learning of that material. Dual coding is basically adding a visual to verbal terminology. We're going to cover this a little bit more in the accelerated learning and mnemonics training aspect because that's what a lot of mnemonics are, is visual aids that we create that are creative, that are kind of out there that help us remember a topic. Um, but this can also work such as in a presentation adding more pictures, which I probably should have done for exactly that purpose. <laughs> yes. Now for us old people, I have to add, when you talk about dual coding, I was a little confused by that, but I think of it as multimodal learning. So for example, if you leave your home and you can't remember whether or not you turned off the oven, the way to do it is you sing. You say, I turned off the oven, you will remember that. So. I see why you're calling it dual coding, but I think of it as multi multimodal. It could be kinesthetic, it could be, you know, in other words, it's not only the visual. Yes, uh, that's actually something that I, I've... Example, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that was, thank you. Um, I've kind of wondered that as well. Most of the time when I read the literature on it, or if you uh, look at the Learning Scientist website, it focuses mostly on visual. I don't know if there's a reason it's that it couldn't... Of us. Most of us. <laughs> yeah, I'm not entirely sure if it does not apply strictly to the others or if it's just mostly focused, the research in the past has been focused on um, visual, but I would say yes, dual coding in a more general sense definitely can be used in any other sort of tactile or, or sensory input. <clears throat> um, interleaving has really been around for a while, but no one's quite figured out how to use it properly in every context. There's not a set way to do it. There are general principles depending on the material and depending on the student, but the basic principle is instead of studying all of biology Monday, all of math Tuesday, all of social sciences Wednesday, we're going to study maybe 30, 60 minutes of one course, then switch to another, then switch to another, and by intermixing the courses, sometimes that'll allow learners to make connections between the separate disciplines that they wouldn't have otherwise made because they're cutting them off as strictly separate. It also, some of the research has said that we don't need to switch off in a, uh, a necessarily repeating order. So instead of A, B, C, A, B, C, it can be A, B, B, A, C, A, um, and back and forth. Again, this one is kind of confusing because I can't give you an exact roadmap. It's just kind of a fun one to play with and uh, can depend a lot on the subjects. If I'm learning anatomy and Latin, for instance, you would think they're very separate but that would probably be easier to intermix than anatomy and Spanish because a lot of anatomical, uh, the bones and muscles and everything are named after a lot of Latin roots. So that one might make more sense when certain topics are more related, <clears throat> when those connections can be made. <laughs> can I just um, ask another question? That seems perfectly logical when we're talking about learning. However, after many years in business, the thing we're all taught to is to be productive is you stick to stick with something that's highly technical. You stick with it until you're done because to get out of it and then go back in will take so much more time and effort and refocus than to just stay in there and get it done. Let's say take a simple example, you know, accounting. Let's say you gotta do this on a checkbook. It wouldn't work if you keep getting off of that and doing something else. But I think the point is that's not learning, that's doing. Correct. You're talking about yeah. task switching, which yeah, is, yes, task switching It more has to do with focusing on one thing and, and not trying to multitask because, yes, there is a, a lag time between switching tasks. That's the activity of doing it. Actually absorbing the information is what we're 
talking about here, and it allows you to make connections to different material. Um, so yes, I would say there's a difference in, in the absorption of it versus the activity of putting out the, yeah. Um, and then combining space retrieval is the combination of two of the strongest techniques that we have evidence for. The most robust studies have been done on these. And this is basically combining the spacing effect and retrieval practice, which also goes by recall practice, rehearsal practice, the testing effect, a bunch of different names. Um, space retrieval basically takes spacing effect is learning something multiple times over a period of time. So maybe you studied a month before your exam, two weeks before your exam, a week before, and then a few days before. Retrieval practice comes back to the mistakes we learned earlier, highlighting, rereading textbooks, rereading our notes. When we're rereading, when we're recognizing the material instead of recalling the material, it's not strong. So we want to recall the material or rehearse it without any visual primer, without any primer at all. Can you have a discussion with someone about that topic? Can you help teach them it right now? If I ask you a question, could you recall it without looking at your notes? This is the ability to retrieve or recall the information from your mind, from your memory. And those types of memories are much harder to create initially, but form durable learning for a longer period of time. And when it's mixed with the spacing effect, such as in flashcards are one of the most common ways that students use them, especially in medical school. You can put a simple question or a term or something on one side and try to recall either the associated term for a simple flashcard card, or maybe discuss an entire process on the back side of the flashcard. So the more you can recite on your own, the more you can basically sit up here and teach someone else about the material, uh, the stronger your rehearsal memory is, the stronger your recall is. So adding these two seemingly diff uh, different techniques together in one just makes sense. They work very well for a vast degree of, uh, well, no, I'd say every skill, every thing that you learn. Um, and the, the studies over long-term retention are significant. Most students that do mast studying, so cramming before a test, forget almost all of it within three days. And this is in general. The forgetting curve is three days long. If you don't actively try to remember something, you forget it three days later. However, when they did studies for retrieval practice, and especially space retrieval, students were able to still pass tests months after they were given the material in class. Uh, it's kind of unheard of for most of us that spent a lot of time cramming in, in high school and such. Um, one other one that's uh, a little different than the others. The others are discussed on the Learning Scientist if you want more specific information about each one of them. They have great blogs and podcasts about it. But uh, purposeful and deliberate practice. Anyone that has read Peak by Anders Ericsson might be familiar with this term. Or if you've heard of the 10,000 hour rule by Malcolm Gladwell, that's uh, incorrectly stating this rule. Let's just say. Um, so the 10,000 hour rule was originally saying that anyone can gain mastery of something in 10,000 hours of practice. And he missed a very vital part of that. It's not 10,000 hours of doing anything. It's approximately 10,000 hours that can vary depending on the task, but of effortful practice and improvement. I can sit down and play the same mistakes on a song for hours and hours and hours every day for years and still really suck at creating that song. But noticing where I'm making those mistakes and focusing just on those mistakes, not starting all over at the beginning of the song and working through, focusing on the weak points. That is how you gain mastery of something. So in brief, Anders Ericsson created purposeful practice as a, uh, a basic outline where you need to have your goals set in place. Again, coming back to goals, <clears throat> you need to um, be active in your learning, put in the effort. Learning is not always fun. Sometimes it kind of sucks. But for learners to put in that the the hard time, the hours into it, and then <clears throat> focus on those weak points, on those mistakes, and really concentrate on getting rid of those mistakes before moving on to the next part. So you're mastering each section, I would say, or each subject before moving on to the next. <clears throat> the difference with deliberate practice adds the added benefit of trying to find a mentor if you hit a roadblock or if it's just something that you're at your maximum skill level. Finding someone that can show you how to get past those roadblocks, how to get past those mistakes, can also greatly improve the uh, the time management, how long it takes to master a skill. So his whole book, Peak, uh, I believe is called The Expert of uh, the Study of Expertise, uh, something along those lines, goes into a lot of detail of the research they've done over the past few decades, and uh, they've done a lot of uh, research with medical students in the past few years as well, which is why it was of particular interest. But again. 
focusing on weak points, focusing on failure points, kind of like WHOOP2, we're seeing a lot of overlapping themes with a lot of the research, which means that most of these types of topics are probably very strong, and we should see how we can implement them for our learners or for ourselves. <clears throat> now for the accelerated learning portion. So when I speak about accelerated learning, it's kind of a vague term. People do use it in different manners. I mostly concentrate on speed reading and mnemonic techniques. I'm not going to discuss a lot of speed reading techniques in here because it just requires a lot of time and it requires practice to really go over it. Uh, there are plenty of videos on any of these topics as well that you can look up for more concrete examples. I do have some also on my website, uh, freemeded.org slash medstudent. There's like a free PDF there, which is for students. But uh, if you want any of the charts we're about to look at in the next couple of pages as well, they are in that free PDF. So why we don't focus on speed reading, speed reading first is because anyone can learn to read a bit faster than the normal speed. On average, about 200, 250 words per minute. And that varies by education level, by the material complexity, um, and a few other factors. Also depends how tired you might be. Um, in general, people can at least double, if not triple, their reading speed. So this isn't getting to 10,000 words per minute, like some of the people you might have read in Guinness Book of World Records or something along those lines, but it's significantly faster than most of us normally read. The reason we don't want to focus on these techniques first is because comprehension will go down significantly if you don't have tactics in place to mitigate the faster reading. So this is why we want to focus on memory techniques first. These mnemonic techniques mostly creating imagery that will supplement the verbal text or supplement our class lectures or supplement anything that we're hearing on the radio or a podcast and then placing these images in a fashion that we can store them for later on. Generally this is known as a, a memory palace or the technique is called the method of loci or loci, however you pronounce it. Um, but first, before we get into the actual practice, I do want to, uh, <clears throat> oh yeah, forgot about this little chart. So the reason I focus on accelerated learning, especially for uh, graduate students and medical students, is the amount of information we have to remember each year just keeps going up, but the amount of time doesn't. If we have traditional learning and a traditional timeline, it can often allow for deep learning because let's say in a semester you have 16 weeks, it's a lot of time to go over chapters, to discuss with friends, to potentially learn deeper learning for that subject. But a lot of students also don't do that. They're not active with their education. Uh, using a, a traditional timeline with accelerated learning just wouldn't be efficient. You'd have several weeks at the end of each semester where you probably wouldn't have much to do. Maybe review the material, but it wouldn't be the best use of your time when you still have so much more information you need to uh, condense in a very short schedule of your academic year, your academic calendar. <clears throat> doing an accelerated learning style with traditional timeline will, or um, sorry, vice versa. Did I say that right? Learning at a traditional pace with an accelerated timeline. So a lot of schools are doing accelerated courses at 8 to 12 weeks versus 16 weeks for a semester, for instance. Uh, if you're learning in a traditional manner, you're not going to have enough time. You're going to have to try to cram too much information. And I feel like this is where a lot of schools are going currently, trying to learn more information in a shorter period of time. I know, uh, at least from the med school perspective, again, a lot of information, but we're not being taught how to learn or learn more effectively. So we're trying to cram more and more information in the same amount, uh, the same time slot, the same semester length every year. And it just gets worse and worse every year. So I think the solution to this is using accelerated learning with an accelerated timeline. And uh, currently there's not a lot of testing done on this because it is difficult to teach accelerated learning to an entire class. It takes time to do that. It takes time to learn these uh, techniques, figure out which ones work for you. There's basically an infinite number of tools that you can use, but you need to find out which ones work for you and in which situations. Um, and yeah, I should have enough time. Okay, next page. Yes. Yeah, just ask a question. One of the things I think is um, very amazing is whether deep learning is something that's entirely done, let's just say intentionally, or whether something intuitive comes into play. I think for medicine, for example, they really experienced surgeon physicians at some point they believe you know they act as though they're operating on instinct, which is highly trained. So I'm always a little wondering whether the deep learning, when you think about uh, what is his name, Huckman, uh, thinking fast and slow. Mm -hmm. and some, do we know how to manage 
I guess the um, triggering of intuitive and instinctive learning based on how we're doing things explicitly. Do we know how to do that yet? Or does it just sort of happen? I, I like those uh, examples in Thinking Fast and Slow from Daniel Kahneman and uh, Tversky. Um, that's also kind of covered in Peak with Anders Ericsson. Uh, it's a little complicated for, for this discussion. If there's time at the end, I'd like to come back to it. But uh, to summarize my understanding is, as you gain mastery over a subject, you gain more mental representations. This is uh, another example used as someone that can do 30 chess games blindfolded simultaneously. This is an example given in Peak. And that's because they have really strong mental representations, just like a surgeon would for the anatomy and for the procedure. So it is developed. <clears throat> for the most part, my understanding. Uh, briefly, technology in education. Technology is advancing in every aspect of life, obviously, and it's greatly influencing most of education at this point. Unfortunately, a lot of the uh, law schools and medical schools are more conservative and falling far behind on these, but some ways that we can use these to improve either in our own personal studies or in uh, our learner studies. Hopefully, I can discuss that briefly here before we get into the actual techniques for mnemonics. So online education gives us a wide range of new environments that weren't previously conducive. We've had online education for a long time, but a lot of the first generation of online courses were messy. They were hard to navigate for students. They were very difficult to set up for instructors, but that's getting increasingly easier every year. There are a lot of free platforms now that instructors, whether you be a, an individual instructor just wanting to teach your, uh, a subject that you're familiar with, teaching photography, teaching how to fly a, uh, what are they called? Um, yeah, the, the little toys. Um, drones, thank you. Brain dump. Uh, yes, the drones. And, and there are courses for everything in some medium or another because it's becoming so much easier to do so. And the video software, the presentation software is improving. What this does is it really gives teachers, instructors, the benefit of reaching a wider audience. We can reach an international audience now on certain platforms. This also benefits the students in so many ways because they no longer have to schedule their entire week around when the lecturer is going to be in the lecture hall giving the same lecture that they've been giving every semester or every year for God knows how long. The benefits on both sides are very obvious. The lecturer can now focus less on lecturing because they can do it once, put up a pre-recorded lecture, and now focus on actually educating and mentoring their students, which is why most people get into education to begin with. They don't want to be a professional lecturer. And students now can have families, can work, can come back to the material whenever they want. They can watch the videos faster in case they're already familiar with this subject, or they can go back and rewatch a lecture if they had trouble with it. Uh, the benefits on both sides are endless, and the, the reason that we're still doing brick and mortar besides just convenience and uh, a few other things I don't want to get into, um, it, it's becoming less relevant every year. One environment that is really interesting for uh, uh, switching, and this can be done in class as well, but I find it to be very useful in an online-based environment is student-centered learning. And one form of this is PBL or problem-based learning. This is where we can form creative thinkers instead of just students that are sitting there watching our lectures. We can form groups with online chats or with different forums, give them a problem, let the students figure it out. And then the instructor or a TA or maybe an upperclassman can just act as a mediator and make sure they don't go too far off of target. Make sure to keep them on the tracks. This lessens everyone's uh, time, or lessens the instructor's time having to, to create all this material and to lecture, and it gives the students the ability to really focus on problem solving, to working with their peers, to not being isolated in education, which is also uh, an increasing problem just in general with younger generations, mine included, just isolating themselves with technology. This is forming a technology bond between the students, and these cohorts can be very, very productive when scheduled properly, when set up properly. Uh, in general, they need the students have to have a foundational knowledge before this can be implemented properly, but then once that foundational knowledge is there, the amount that they learn uh, in some studies has been exponentially greater with these problem-based learning groups, with these critical thinking groups, than just continuing on with lectures, and sometimes in certain topics even from gaining hands-on experience. This is compared to instructor-centered learning, which I keep going back to as uh, lecture-based learning. <clears throat> um, for non-traditional courses, we have things like Udemy and other for pay courses that anyone can access, whether it be us or our learners, and that can act to supplement information they're learning from a traditional class, 
or just for fun. But it also gives them more resources to, to compare against. Maybe they learn this material better from this instructor and this one from that instructor. We can also see this in MOOCs, Massive Online Open Courses. Some of the most common ones being Coursera and edX. I believe they're both .org, Coursera.org and edX.org. <clears throat> these were actually set up by uh, large institutions such as MIT and Harvard and Stanford to put introductory courses to almost all of their courses. It's hard to find a subject now that you can't type in their search bar and find several courses on it. They're all available for free. Now, they do charge you if you want a certificate, but you can audit any course on these for free. So, uh, for instance, for my medical school, I use a lot of these courses, try to search out the similar topic to coincide with when I was taking the course uh, in my actual rotations. That way, sometimes their instructors have more knowledge on this than that, or maybe they have better graphics that I can understand better. The resources available to these big schools through the MOOCs are often greater than what the average educator can get. So giving students, giving learners all of these different options, or to use them ourselves too, can really improve their comprehension and the quality of their education. <coughs> it does change the student landscape a little bit. There are more requirements. Students have to take more responsibility for their education. But the more responsibility the student takes for their education, the more engaged they can become, and the less time that is utilized from the instructor. Uh, Self-directed learning and self-regulated learning are increased in these types of learning platforms often, and these can be used interchangeably, even though uh, some, some in the field argue about one being a subset of the other. For our purposes, it just means that the student has to regulate their own learning a little better. They need to know when they're going to sit down, since they don't have a set schedule two, three times a week to go sit in that lecture hall. When are they going to set aside time to do this? What are they going to happen if they have extra work days or if uh, a problem happens with their internet? What, are they going to set whoops where they can overcome these obstacles in their own education? So, uh, And also the access to technology and internet can be a problem with certain demographics, so we should take this into consideration if we're making these types of resources for, uh, for certain demographics or for certain courses. But having these options just, I, I feel, is going to greatly shape the future of education in general, and I really think that most of it, including med school, should go to the MOOC type of, MOOC type of uh, uh, scheduling so we can study at our own pace, maybe do some sort of competency-based study at your own time, and then we can focus the clinical aspect being our main focus of actually being in school. <clears throat> and of course, if we don't have a way to self-assess, then we don't know if we've gone anywhere. So real quick, so we can get to the rest of this, we need to know what we've learned, how to assess that we've learned it. Journaling is one of the recommendations I make for most learners and uh, instructors as well. Setting those SMART goals, write it down somewhere. Make sure you have a record to keep yourself honest. It's easy to say that I did it or I didn't do it, but then not really understand why or how to achieve a, a better result next time, how to improve on our learning. We need to rec uh, record our wins, but especially our failures. Again, assessing why we failed. What can we do next time to prevent that from happening? These can be objective, such as from our report cards, keeping track of those, or graded assignments, or they can be subjective. How do we feel? Do we feel like we have a deeper understanding? Do we feel like we can teach someone else this material? We need to record both of those. Any sort of plans that have changed, maybe our ultimate goal for our SMART goals has changed. Now we have to shift everything over. Maybe we have to shift all of our schedule now because this big project just got dumped on my lap. All of these alterations can be recorded, and the best way to know that we're actually keeping on tabs with everything is to record them in some sort of journal, whether this be physical or digital, just so we have a record to keep ourselves honest with ourselves. <clears throat> of course, if you need more help, there are always tutors, mentors, coaches that you can try to utilize depending on what the coursework is. Sometimes you need to go outside of your own instructors, outside of your own university to find the right person for your needs. Uh, you can also ask someone, such as peers, families, friends, that have gone through this before. Someone that's gone through the exact same process before, taken the same course before, learned the same skill before, would be a great person, potentially, to ask how to change what you're already doing and to improve on what you're already doing. If you don't have those available, there are always online forums uh, on websites. There are groups on social media like Facebook. There are Slacks and group for a growing number of topics. Go and find people that have similar interests to you and maybe as much or a little bit more knowledge that you can learn from and share ideas with. Okay, 
now for the last few minutes. How much time do we have? Like 15 minutes? <laughs> Until they kick us out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let's try to go through a few mnemonics techniques. These are just uh, three main tools that I like to start with. There are an infinite number of tools, and new ones are coming out all the time. You can learn a lot about these through following Memory Champions and the Memory Championship. But there are uh, a lot of resources out there, videos you can look up these terms if you want more information. Real briefly for the PEG system, <clears throat> PEG system is a way to change numbers into visual associations, into visual markers. I use the term visual marker for any sort of visual uh, aid that we can attach to a word, a principle, a topic, a concept. <clears throat> in this chart here, this can be found in my PDF if you want a copy later, but I do recommend everyone make their own if they want to use this technique later on, because these are ones that are personal to me. <clears throat> it's really small, so let me try to, to show it here. I thought this was going to be <laughs> a little bigger. Uh, peg system, we have numbers 1 through 10. You can also do 0 through 9, whatever works better for you. And then these columns represent the associations I've made. Uh, in general, with columns, this one is a rhyme, or it sounds like, the shape, or it looks like, an association, or it seems like. So people use a sound like, looks like, sees like uh, little yes, term to, uh, to help remember the different ways you can change a number into a visual association. For example, the number one, the rhyme could be something like gun. The shape, maybe a pen or a pencil. The association, something singular, like a snowboard. Uh, number two, sounds like shoe. Shape like, kind of like a swan net is one I hear a lot. So the the top part of the two is the swan neck, and the bottom is is the the base of the two. Um, or the, an association could be anything plural. So instead of a snowboard, skis or shoes or something like that. And you can have multiple images that you use. That way, if you have long strings of numbers, you don't need to keep reusing the same visual image. So, for example, um, will someone like to give me just a four-digit number? <coughs> <laughs> 7196. 7196. Okay. I hate sevens too. Sevens, there's not a lot of good ones for. But all right. <clears throat> 7196. Seven, we don't have a lot of good ones here on the chart either. I think we have Evan. We have uh, Evan or Even. Uh, I usually use the shape. So something like a sickle or a hockey stick kind of has the shape of a seven. And there's not a good association. I actually had to Google seven and association and try to find out something. Apparently there's a seven society. I don't know what they do. Anyway, so I'll, I'll stick with a hockey stick for this one. Then one. Well, do we want to do one gun? We already have a hockey stick. Having another object would be kind of weird. Maybe, uh, but then a pencil or a pen would be two. And then also a snowboard too. But what we, we could do instead is instead of just a regular hockey stick like you buy at the store, we can make it a cartoon hockey stick. So now it's sprouted arms and legs. What is the hockey stick caricature now holding? Maybe it's holding a gun. So now we have 7-1. Uh, was it 9-2? So 9-6. See, I didn't encode it yet. So uh, <laughs> I'm trying to yeah, explain it. And um, Okay, so blossoming flower is one of the shapes that it could look like. So nine, maybe a sunflower or something coming up. Uh, so now the hockey stick caricature, caricature has a gun, shoots it, and a little sunflower pops out instead of a bullet. Kind of seen this in cartoons anyway. This is why I like using cartoonish ones, because it's easier to play around with the realism. Uh, six. Uh, let's see. I don't like that one. I don't like that one. So having multiple ones to choose from can help. Um, okay, sticks. So we're going with a rhyming one there. So now we have the <clears throat> the seven caricature, shooting a gun, which is one, out pops a sunflower or some sort of flower, which is nine, but instead of petals on the sunflower, you just have a bunch of jagged sticks coming out of it around the fence. So now we have this weird little image, and it doesn't have to make sense. In fact, the weirder it is, and for a lot of people, the more sexually explicit or grosser it is, the stronger it'll stick in your memory, adding more emotional tone. It's also why uh, memory champions recommend you never use people close to you, like family members in any of your mnemonics, because sometimes they can get in awkward positions. Um, but now we have a way to simply remember that four-digit number. And you can go on and on and on. You can have, instead of it all being one image, we can make a story out. Uh, so instead, maybe the seven caricature is uh, throwing a gun. And instead of a gun, uh, let's see, nine, instead of a flower, we also have cat. 
has an association for nine because nine lives. So now he's throwing the gun and it's hitting a cat in the head. And what happens? The cat, he falls off a pier and lands on a bunch of sticks or something like that. So you can play around with the same numbers in a variety of different ways, but whatever comes to you naturally first is probably going to be the strongest for you. So hearing someone else's is kind of weird, but if you play around with this for a little bit, just go with a couple of four or five digit numbers later on throughout the day and, and try to think of something uh, fun to play with. And you can make these stories that will allow you to remember long strings of numbers. Uh, that's the pig system, converting numbers directly into images. Another method for converting numbers into words is called the major method. I don't use this one as much personally because I can never remember the key because I just haven't put much time into dedicating myself to using it and I like the pig system. I've used that for a long time. But this method allows you to convert depending on the number, 1 through 10 going across the top. I know it's really hard to see. I'm sorry about that. These are also on the PDF I said uh, is available online if you want to use them or you can just look it up. The same key applies for every uh, major method, major system. Zero being C, S, or Z. One being D, T, or TH sounding. Two being N, three M, uh, so on and so forth. And if you could see this, you would notice that there are no vowels. So it's kind of like a Vandy license plate. You can create words uh, by placing vowels wherever you need them. So let's do two examples here. Uh, we have six or seven digit, two examples of seven digits each. Now, for the most part, people can remember seven digits on their own, so even remembering four digits for the uh, the peg system is not going to be necessary. But if you develop it out with shorter numbers, I mean, you can get longer and longer associations later on as it becomes quicker to you. And all these techniques, they just take practice, and you can become quicker with them. Um, so let's go and make the translation, so you can hopefully actually read that where you can't read it up here. So the five is an L, two, N. The eights can be an F, a V, or a PH sound. And just give you 30 seconds here. Can you make any words or phrases or sentences with this first example? Raise your hand if you have one. Make nonsense, it'll out the first one. Okay, what is it? Line, L-I-N-E, mm -hmm. 4-F-O-R, <laughs> Tone, T-O-E-R. Okay, no, that works. Or what about using the D, line for dinner? You could try that. So, it's just... Or, or diner. Yeah. Dinner, diner. Yeah, diner would work better because there's not two ends there. So, um, point being... The more creative you can get with these, the more practice you uh, implement, you can have very long strings of words and sentences. Uh, I've seen people make entire poems out of these at times. It can be a fun way to, to try to convert things really quickly from long strings of numbers into just a verbal association. And then if you have that, like a line for the diner, now you can picture a line for the diner and you just have to remember that one visual. Uh, one thing I don't like about the major method as much is you have to kind of convert it twice. You have to now convert that image back to trying to remember what the image actually was, which is line for diner, and then back to all of the, the key here. But a lot of people really like this, and I would suggest that the peg system is probably better off for lower digits, like 10, less than 15, whereas 20, 30, 40 would probably be better here. Once we get more than that, there are more advanced techniques that we're not going to really discuss here, but you can... Definitely look them up. There's like person action object, object, which is what memory champions use to remember thousands of digits in just a few minutes. Um, it's another example here, but I want to get to the last part, so we won't cover that one. <clears throat> so the main thing, uh, the, the main way we can remember a lot of these visual markers, whether it be from the PEG system, major method, or any other tool that we decide to use for whichever topic we're trying to uh, attack is called the memory palettes. And how we start off with the memory palace is by creating these visual markers. So those we just created a, a number association, a singular association. But what if we want to make more complex associations or with a topic that's a little more complicated? So this is one I use for a microbiology course that I created a few years ago. Course is down. All the videos are still available for free online. But um, I wanted to add a memory palace to the entire thing. After doing the first section of the first module in a 10 module course, I realized it was way too time consuming and getting very expensive to hire graphic designers to make these images. So uh, that's on the back burner for now. But 
Um, because it was a microbiology class, I figured one of the easiest ones to start with is Staphylococcus aureus because it's one of the bugs that most people in the general population has also heard of. And for no other reason, you've probably heard of MRSA, methylation resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Um, it can be a very scary bug, but the normal variant is really easy to treat and not too scary. But there are a couple of things that medical students and other healthcare students need to know that are properties associated with this bug. Just for testing purposes, you'll probably never use this material again, as is standardized testing for you. But Staphylococcus aureus, we can actually, we can obviously say Staph aureus. Aureus translates into gold. I believe it's Latin. I don't recall the, the language root. So we can easily form a golden staff there. Now we know which bug we're talking about, but we have these extra weird things here. Complete hemolysis, catalase positive, protein A. These are going to make no sense to you, but probably unless you have a, a healthcare background. But for a medical student, we need to remember these, at least for our tests. And a lot of bugs have these similar properties, so it's hard to differentiate between them sometimes. They'll give you a list of answers, and four of the five could potentially work for this one or for that one. So you have to remember every single one of these characteristics. So... <laughs> Whatever comes to mind for you first is going to be your best visual, most likely. You can always change them later if you need to, but for instance, for for these complete homolysis, for some reason complete made me think of white, like a complete light, all the colors of the spectrum being white, as opposed to like black absorbing all colors of the spectrum. And because it's catalase positive, well, obviously a cat pops into mind. So the next visual I came up with was a white cat holding a staff. So we know that staff aureus is white, so it's complete and catalase positive. On top of that, catalase positive has other functions. It can break up uh, aggregations of immune system uh, components, and it works to, to basically evade the immune system. So I needed something to remember that. So the next one I added was aggregation somehow in my mind turned to a synonym of congregation, and congregation being raised Catholic made me think of the Pope hat. So I gave a cat a Pope hat just to remind me of that. And then the protein A, put a big red A in the Pope hat. So now I have all of these little details in there, and they're just weird associations that came to me. And we can teach an entire class on how to play around with these associations, how to make stronger associations versus weaker ones, but just to get the basic concept across. We also want to know which antibiotics are useful against this bug. It's very important for medical students to know. And for the normal staph aureus, uh, penicillin works very well. For the MRSA version, we need a, a, a different type of mechanism, so we use vancomycin, or vanco for short. So the image it came up with a pencil villain for penicillin, and he's driving a corporation van, so vancomycin. Now we have a visual marker, <clears throat> and we can add to these later on. We can add more to the images we already have or create new images, but we want them to coincide with each other somehow, and we need a place to store them. This is where the memory palace comes in. A memory palace can be any location, Real or fictional, most people start off with houses that they're used to, houses that they grew up with, their current home, maybe restaurants you frequent. People even use video games that they're used to certain scenarios all the time. Could be a place you work, a hospital you've been to, any place you could think of inside or outside. Here we're going to use a student bedroom, just a general bedroom. We're going to have a desk, bookshelves, a bed, light fixtures, ceiling fixtures, doors, closets. Anything in this room can become a micro station within our macro station. And we want to pick a location to place these images. So here we're going to place them on the desk. So we have our little catalase positive protein A staph aureus guy. And he's particularly laying down because he's being run over by the vanco and penicillin, showing that that can help kill this bug. So having that kind of dynamic uh, cartoony animation in your head can help show the relationship between different dissociative uh, entities. And we can do that for infinite numbers of subjects. We can add multiple memory palaces together. I've even interviewed someone that has connected thousands of memory palaces together in order to remember millions of facts. No idea how he does that. Probably superhuman, but um, just showing that with enough creativity and time and just having fun with this and not looking at it as a study technique, but a fun creative activity, you can uh, greatly impact the fashion you study, the fashion that you teach, and the amount of material you can retain uh, long term. So, in conclusion, we've gone over a lot of the, the cognitive psychology and learning psychology for evidence-based techniques, <clears throat> how technology is improving and changing the landscape, learning how to learn is much more important than teaching. This is something we really need to get past, is trying to teach at students 
and start learning with students. And using accelerated learning can be fun and creative. And that is my presentation. Thank you. I think our time's up, but until they kick us out, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. You're all out of questions. <laughs> well, I, I think what I'm a little stunned by is sometimes I think it's just easy to remember something. So mm -hmm. this seems like just a lot of work. Yeah, if but it's... I, I think it's about the volume that you need to remember. Yeah, and for long term. Because a lot of times we'll remember something short term, but we forget it very quickly. But you also don't need to use these techniques for everything. Use them for things that are really your weak points. Things that you keep coming across and keep forgetting. So you don't need to do it for everything, although um, from my understanding, once you become very proficient at these techniques, you can think up the visual markers just like that as you are reading. So you, and, and then you get the second word thing, because now I'm, I'm looking at the memory power and say, oh, that's too cluttered, I can't deal with that. So now I've got to imagine a bookcase where I can stick all my <laughs> You can separate them out, too. A lot of people will separate them out much more, not as condensed yeah. as that, so they might have the cat in one place, the stick in another, the hat in another. They can be as separate as you want or as condensed as you are comfortable. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Did you develop this because you are studying or are you a doctor or studying? I am studying, yeah. Uh, part of what came of this was the struggles I was running into and going over material over and over again and not really retaining it like I thought I was. And this is a common problem a lot of students have. So I um, finished up my clinical rotations and sort of took off this time to explore more and to develop some resources for other students. So hopefully they won't have the same problems that I did and still do. I'm not perfect at these. I'm not an expert. I just find that they're very useful techniques and fun ways to increase our motivation and engage in the learning. Yes. What's the, you're doing learning, but what about play and serendipity and all that other stuff that sort of happens? Plain serendipity. The learning is not really serendipity or, or uh, bulb lighting or anything. So uh, I don't know. These can be kind of yeah. fun to make sometimes. I, it depends on your comfort level, I suppose, like too. But, but there's about. been a lot of inventions mm -hmm. and stuff that are just insight instantly, you know, which is not really learning. It just, we put stuff together in an order and all of a sudden the, the problem is solved. Yeah. But that's not really learning. That's invention and stuff like that. I guess I really should have added a section on gamification in my technology bit because that's uh, another route that I'm really trying to go with future medical content is mm -hmm. to find ways to gamify the content to make it more engaging to add that play aspect for uh, more advanced learners for medical students well, graduate the learners. The way I develop stuff is play. Okay. I play on the computer with words or <laughs> equations and come up with an answer. I don't really study anything. Yeah. I really love I the idea it. of adding play as well. Um, I go on vacation, and the answer comes to me, like here. <laughs> Can I ask you another question about, I, I think it's a very useful way to learn, many of us do, when you have verbalized it. One of the things I love about Google, it's not that I trust everybody it gives me, but I have to really learn how to ask for what I want, find out, tr trace these are what appear to be irrelevant lateral roots, or decision trees, and that's a very, and you really do learn stuff when you do that. That sounds like elaboration. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. So sometimes we hear these terms and we're not really sure what they mean in practice. That is one example exactly of right. elaboration. Yeah. yeah. That's what I would classify that as. Yeah. Mm. Yes. I have a cartoon on my, um, my bulletin board at work. It's a picture of a young woman stooping down to go through a card catalog. And the caption is prehistoric Googling. <laughs> That's what we used to do. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and hopefully the future of technology as far as adding play, as far as gamification of these uh, techniques will increase with time. But right now it's just still very time consuming and expensive. And not a lot of universities are willing to put a lot of time and energy and money into these yet. And us independent instructors uh, don't have the resources. <laughs> but that's definitely something I would be very interested in learning more and, and implementing in future designs. Yes? In your studying, did you ever come across any papers where they're looking at the benefits or if there is any on virtual reality and augmented reality applications to learn? Oh, uh, I did not look into that specifically. No, I've, I've heard some mixed 
reviews about it. I think there's probably a lot of potential, but I'm not sure we know how to do it properly yet. It's kind of like interleaving. There's a lot of questions. It can be very beneficial in this setting, but maybe not so much in this. But yeah, I'm not, a, not an expert on that one. Experience is, is sort of proven. Yeah. If you can use uh, you know, VR, your experience from a place you've never been to will be much more real as if you had actually been there than, you know. So, but that's a different, that's a different mm -hmm. kind of way. That's like, that's immersion. Yeah. We could probably do that more with like surgery where they exactly. can wear a, a camera or something in the surgical suite. Exactly. Um, often it's more difficult to do with primary care and everything with HIPAA laws, with blotting out people's faces and just the, the fast paced action of how the hospital works. They're not, not wanting all of those secrets to go out. <clears throat> but, uh, I'd say there's definitely room to grow and, and hopefully they can be very useful. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.